Well, again, good morning. Well, if you remember, if you were with us last week, where we left off, it was in Luke chapter 8, and we ended in verse 25. Now, remember what's going on. Jesus has been teaching the crowds, and then he tells his disciples, get in the boat. We're going to the other side. We're going to cross over the Sea of Galilee. We're going to go over to the Gentile side uh, of the lake, and they head out. But before they get there, when they're out in the middle of the lake, uh, a ferocious storm suddenly comes up, and, and they find themselves in a terrible situation very quickly. They are overwhelmed by the storm. It is far too big for the little boat that they're in. They're bailing, but they can't keep up. They're struggling, but they're beginning to go down. They wake Jesus up. He gets up, and he commands the storm to stop. And it does. It does. It's, it's an amazing moment. It, it was a moment that I think would have been indelibly imprinted on the disciples' minds and hearts, a moment that they could have never forgotten. It, it was so impactful that, that even as they pulled up to the other side, as they arrived to the other side of the lake, they, they were still talking about it amongst themselves and asking themselves the, the main pertinent question. Not so much what happened. They saw what happened. But who is this? Who is this who can speak to the wind and the waves and they obey? It was an amazing moment. It was an amazing moment that made them reconsider everything that they knew about their rabbi, their teacher. You see, they, they knew him as Jesus of Nazareth, but here he showed himself to not truly be from Nazareth, but he was Jesus from heaven, that, that he was God in human flesh. And it says they are pondering this that they arrive at the other side, and that's where we dropped off last week, and that's where we will pick up this morning. If you do this, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. Find verse 26 there. I'm going to read our passage for us. I'm going to invite you, if you can, to stand out of respect for the Word of God. You can follow along. Please do, and I'll read our passage. Here's what Luke writes, beginning in verse 26 of chapter 8. Then they sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When he got out on land, a demon-possessed man from the town met him. For a long time, he had worn no clothes, and he did not stay in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and said in a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus? Son of the Most High God, I beg you, don't torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was guarded, bound by chains and shackles, he would snap the restraints and be driven by the demon into deserted places. What is your name? Jesus asked him. Legion, he said, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to banish them to the abyss. A large herd of pigs was there feeding on the hillside. The demons begged him to permit them to enter the pigs, and he gave them permission. The demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the men who tended them saw what had happened, they ran off and reported it in the town and in the countryside. Then people went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man the demons had parted from sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Meanwhile, the eyewitnesses reported to them how the demon-possessed man was delivered. 
Then all the people of the Gerasene region asked him to leave them because they were gripped by great fear. So getting into the boat, he returned. The man from whom the demons had departed begged him earnestly to be with him. But he sent him away and said, go back to your home and tell all that God has done for you. And off he went, proclaiming throughout the town how much Jesus had done for him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word, for your Holy Spirit who is our teacher. God, I pray that you would teach us this morning that you would apply the truths of your word to our hearts, make them soft and receptive, make our minds attentive, and Lord, work in us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. There is an amazing triad of miracles that we're reading about here in this section of Luke's gospel. Uh, really, we began with the first one uh, last week, uh, if you recall, Jesus calming this storm by just speaking a word. And then in today's passage, uh, Jesus, he frees a man who is absolutely engulfed by evil. And the next week, we're going to see Jesus encountering a woman who had been sick for 12 years and healing her. And then also raising from the dead a 12-year-old little girl. It's interesting to stop and to think for just a moment about the, the picture that, that Scripture is painting here, the picture that, that Luke is giving us here of Jesus. Last week, we saw very clearly that Jesus is greater than any storm that might come at us in this life. Isn't that true? Jesus is great. It doesn't matter what our circumstances are. It doesn't matter what comes. Those things will be far greater than us, but none of them will be greater than Jesus. There is nothing that this world can throw at us that is too big for Jesus. Next week, we'll see that Jesus is big enough that even when, when our, our most desperate situations get even worse, even when we have lost all hope, even when it seems like it's just too late, that it is never too late for Jesus, that it is never beyond hope when Jesus is involved. This week, this week we see that not only is Jesus big enough to deal with our circumstances, the situations outside of us, that he is enough to deal with the stuff within us, that he is, he is greater than those things that would bind us and isolate us and seek to rob and to destroy us. Those things, too, are within his reach. Well, should we get started? Look at verse 26. And remember, the storm has just ceased. Don't, don't forget the context. Remember that the disciples are probably still shaking a bit from the intense effort of bailing out the boat and screaming instructions to each other and screaming at Jesus to wake up. And then they were probably shaking at the shock of the sudden end of the storm. And so they arrive at the other side of the lake there, the region of the Gerasenes, verse 26 says, which is opposite Galilee. And when he got out on land, a demon-possessed man from the town met him who for a long time had worn no clothes and did not stay in a house but lived in the tombs. You know, I absolutely love this scene. It's just insane. It's, it's un, unimaginable that, that you could go, and, you know, from the frying pan into the fire for these disciples to go from this this sinking of the boat amidst the lake and Jesus calming the storm to to all of a sudden stepping out onto land while you're wondering who is this one who just stopped the storm with a word and having this demon-possessed man come running up. It, it was interesting. The disciples must have been rather distracted as they were coming up onto shore because they knew this from the Psalms because the Psalms in several places declare clearly 
that God is the one who can calm the storms. No man can calm a storm. Did you try that last night? Did you walk out into the street in front of your house in, in the midst of the storm that wasn't nearly as big as we were kind of hoping and had been warned that it would be, you know, the end of all storms. Uh, but they would never do that to boost ratings, just tell us that it was going to be worse. But so, you know, here comes the storm. Did you walk out into the street in front of your house and command it to stop with a word? You would have gotten very wet, huh? maybe hit by lightning. But that would have been about it. Nothing would have happened, and yet, because you're not God. And yet Jesus, Jesus speaks to the storm. The Psalms say this, Psalm 89.9, you rule the raging sea. When its waves surge, you still them. The psalmist speaking of God, God himself. And so here are the disciples, they're processing all this. They're, they're thinking about, uh, about the fact that Jesus had just done what could not be done, that he had, he had stopped the storm with a word. And so they're asking the question, who is this? Apparently they didn't know. So God sent them the answer. And so just as they're stepping out onto ground, dry ground, they're probably kissing the sand, happy to be off the water, when a demon-possessed naked man comes charging up to them. Actually, uh, Matthew tells us there were two of them. Luke tells us they were naked. And Mark tells us they came running up and threw themselves in front of them. That'd be terrifying in and of itself. You know, though, this account really isn't focused on the disciples and what they experienced, nor is it even completely focused upon this man or these men and what they experienced. But really, the focus of this passage is on Jesus. It's on Jesus. Jesus was enough to stop the storm. And just like the, the storm was too much for the boat. The storm was too much for the disciples. So too, the evil that this man, that these men had encountered, it, it was too much for them. It had utterly overwhelmed them. They were no match for it. They had been conquered by it. Look at what it says about this man's life. And, and think about this in the context that this was a real person who at one point had a family and a job and a house, but now for a long time he had worn no clothes. You know, that can have an adverse impact upon your employment situation when you refuse to wear clothes anymore. It, you know, it, it can harm your family relationships when you choose to live amongst the tombs instead of amongst the living. You look a little further down there in verse 29, partway through verse 29, we see that many times uh, this demonic spirit had seized this man and though he was guarded, bound by chains and shackles, uh, that he would snap the restraints and be driven by the demon into a certain place. Even his community was trying to help. They were trying to step in to, to bind him and to guard him, but it was more evil than they could handle. It was overpowering for them as well. This man is fully engulfed into the hands of evil, and that evil was seeking to destroy him. You know, it, it's in Mark's gospel that we learn that when the demon would seize him, he would often grab stones and begin to gash himself with them, seeking to destroy himself. He was owned by this demonic spirit. It controlled him. It defiled him. It, it surrounded him with death. He, he no longer lived with his family. Everything had been taken from him, family and friends. His life and his purpose had been devoured. And in the end, it was seeking to destroy him. You know, this guy gives us an incredibly graphic picture of what it is to be captive to sin without Jesus. Of what it is to be without Jesus, to be captive to sin. By the way, those are the same thing. Those are the same thing. Because if we are without Jesus, we are captive to sin. 
sin causes us to be bound up and it causes us to become isolated from those around us. Uh, we are, are bound either by that overwhelming hunger for our sin or by a, a legalistic response to it. We become isolated, we begin to hide because of our sin, or we're abandoned as others are repulsed by our sin. Just like this man, sin leaves us empty, alone, and despairing of life. That, by the way, is what the enemy wants for each and every one of us. In John chapter 10, there Jesus describes what the enemy's plan is for humanity. Jesus says this in John 10, 10, he refers to Satan as the thief. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's his plan. That, that, is what, that is what the enemy desires for us. But Jesus, Jesus has a very different plan for us. He wants something very different from us. Jesus goes on to say, but I came so that you might have life and have it abundantly. To have a full life. To have an abundant life. And, and so there you see that this creates a conflict, a spiritual battle, where we have an enemy who wants to destroy us, and we have a Savior who wants to give us life. Just so you know, when it comes to this battle, it's really no contest. It's really no contest. It's never a question of who is stronger or who is more powerful. Jesus is. God is. Always, every time. In fact, the only way that the enemy can ever win is when one of us chooses to refuse Jesus. It's when we choose to spurn his mercy and his grace. And th that is the only way that any of us will ever suffer the hell that Satan wants for us. Because God is stronger. And because any who will turn to Christ, any who will give themselves into his care, who will surrender to Christ, who will belong to Jesus, the enemy can't touch them. Oh, he can tempt and trouble and harass them, but he cannot possess them and he cannot destroy them because we belong to God and God doesn't share. Well, in verse 28, we see this. The demon-possessed man saw Jesus and when he did, the demon cries out and falls down before Jesus and says in a loud voice, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. So notice two dynamics here. Notice, first of all, remember the disciples getting out of the boat, asking who is this then who can stop the storm with a word, and God sends them the answer through a couple of naked demon-possessed guys who let them know that this is Jesus, the son of the most high God. And now, don't get too impressed that the demon knows information about who Jesus is. Understand this. Don't get too impressed with yourself because you have understanding of who Jesus is. James tells us this. Even the demons believe and they shudder. You see, salvation isn't found in having the right information. It isn't found in acceding to the, to the fact, agreeing with the fact that Jesus is God. Salvation is found in surrender. It's coming to a place of saying, Lord, I'm yours. I belong to you. Notice, too, that there is no fight here. You know, Jesus doesn't get into mixed martial arts with the demoniac. There's no battle that takes place. There's not even a struggle for power. It, it, this demon knows very clearly who is in charge. And he throws himself at Jesus' feet. 
because there is no question of where the power lies. In fact, all this demon can do is beg for mercy, plead for mercy, because God is greater than the enemy. Never question that. Never wonder. This is not the yin-yang of Eastern mysticism. This isn't like this cosmic battle between the light side and the dark side, and you don't know who's going to win. No. No, there, there is no question how this will end and who is sovereign and who is not. Jesus, because he is truly God, has authority over Satan and his minions. These demons know that. They know that they must obey Jesus. And, and yes, it isn't just one demon, is it? It's many. Look at verse 30. Jesus says, what is your name? And he answers, legion. And because many demons had entered him, and they, they begged him not to banish them to the abyss. So a Roman legion in that day was about 6,000 soldiers. So here when he says that his name is, ne is legion, he doesn't necessarily mean that there are exactly 6,000 uh, demons within this man, but that there is this overwhelming force. There is this mass of evil. It was more than this man could handle. It was more than his community could handle. You know, even if it had just been one evil spirit, it would have been more than he could handle without Jesus. Because without Jesus, none of us is a match for any evil that resides within. Now, you and I who have given ourselves to Christ, we have the power of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that allows us to resist temptation, right? And that's why God's word promises us that no temptation will seize us except what is common to man is God, and God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear, okay? There will always be a way of escape for us who have the Holy Spirit within us. But let's remember this when we're thinking about the unsaved world. Let's remember this as we turn on the TV and see people doing things, that we just think, how can you do that? Well, the real question is, how can they not do that? They can't resist evil like we can. And without Christ, they are captive to sin. They are overpowered by the world and the flesh and the devil. Those who reject Christ will be devoured by evil because it's too much for them. It's more than they can handle. But it wasn't too much for Jesus. Uh, this legion bows down before him and begs him for mercy, says, don't banish us to the abyss. Instead, look at verse 32. It says, a large herd of pigs was there feeding on the hillside, and the demons begged him to permit him, them to enter the pigs, and he gave permission and the demons came out of the man into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. Now that's weird. That, that is just strange. And it is strange not only in comparison to our experience of life, it's very strange compared to other encounters that Jesus has with the demonic. Do you notice that? Jesus never allows the demonic to speak. He never gives them a platform, and yet here, Jesus asks this demon to speak. He asks him, oh, what is your name? And then when the demons say, hey, don't send us into the abyss, don't lock us down where some of the evil spirits are confined until the time of the end. Don't, don't lock us away, but let us go into these pigs, and Jesus lets them. He lets them go into these poor pigs. I mean, what a waste of bacon. Okay, Jewish, not eating bacon, I get that. But still, what in the world is this about? What is it that Jesus is doing that causes him to respond to this situation so differently from the way that he often responds? Well, first of all, let me say this. Scripture does not tell us why. And so this is just a guess. But I think it's a good guess. I think that Jesus does what he does so that he can show us the full extent and the complete intent 
of this evil. He wants to show us how, how large it is and what its aim is. And so uh, Jesus allows the demon to speak. He, he allows it to, to proclaim that, that it isn't just one, but that it's legion, that there are many. And he allows it to go into those poor pigs and so that his disciples and so that you and I will see that this is real. This man was not just insane or mentally ill. He was demon-possessed. And when those demons left this man, he didn't just regain his sanity. He was freed from his spiritual power. That then they could see visibly taking the pigs off the cliff and into the, into the water. Jesus allowed these pigs to perish to show that evil is real and to show us very starkly, very clearly what the intentions of the enemy are towards us. Because you see, the enemy's aim is always to destroy us. Sin always leads to death. The enemy always pulls us towards sin. He always pushes us towards sin. He is always seeking to tempt us to sin because sin goes to death. And that's what James tells us, right? James chapter one. Remember, James says this. He says, each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. And then after desire has conceived, he gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. And then James says this, don't be deceived. Because we so often are. We believe the advertisements, don't we? You know, you, you see some ad for something, and so you order one, and then it doesn't work like it did on the commercial. What a shocker, huh? What a surprise that, you know, you buy this miracle product, and it turns out to not be so much of a miracle. We buy that same line from the enemy. The enemy comes along and he says, hey, listen, God's just trying to keep this good thing from you. You can go this way. You can do this. It won't really be harmful to you. You, you can involve yourself in this. I mean, it's really, it's not as bad as, as, as God makes it out to be. And we believe the advertisement. But every time, every time he is seeking to move us to death, that's the progression. That's what James says. It goes from temptation to sin and eventually to death because that is what he wants. He wants to destroy us. Sin always progresses. It always grows. And eventually, it always ends in death. Thankfully, though, that isn't our only option, right? We have the Holy Spirit within us. And we have been saved. We have been washed. We have been cleansed. And so as Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 6, the wages of sin is death. That's, the, that's where that goes. But there's another road that we can take. There is the free gift of God, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's, that's what this man chose. Even, even this demon-possessed man who could not, he could not resist evil on his own, he could not deal with these demons on his own, yet he could choose Jesus. He ran to Jesus. He ran to Jesus. That's what we all should do, right? If you haven't run to Jesus and fallen at his feet, you've got to. You've got to. This enemy is more than you can handle, and he will destroy you in the end. But you can turn to Jesus. You can always turn to Jesus. And not because there's something great about you, but because there's something great about Jesus. His power is real. It isn't just some sort of theological mythology that, that we buy into, some sort of spiritualized feel-goodism that, oh, we turn to Jesus and then it's all just, you know, we, we delusionally happy. No, there is real power. There is real power in Christ that can free us from sin that can free us and heal us of the, the brokenness that we so often walk in. 
Jesus' power is real and it makes a difference in the reality of life. He can free us from anything. He can break the chains that the enemy has bound us with. This isn't religious myth. This is reality. Jesus says it this way in John 8, 36. If the Son sets you free, you really will be free. This is reality. When Jesus commanded the demons to come out, we see three things happen right away. Look at verse 33 and on. The demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. And then when the men who had tended to them saw what had happened, they ran off and reported it in the town and in the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man the demons had departed from, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. So what happened when Jesus had cast these demons out of this man? Well, one, it was the end of the pigs. The pigs died. Um, secondly, the people ran off to report what they had seen. And then thirdly, this man was freed, but more than freed, he was healed. Could you imagine what he had experienced? He, he had been in this state for a long time, it says. I, I can't imagine what living the way he lived would do to you. I, I, I would expect him to be someone with a crippled mind for the rest of his life, and yet that is not the case because he was touched by Jesus. He was healed. He was restored completely at peace, clothed, and in his right mind. Because Jesus wanted for this man to have life and to have it abundantly. Oh, the enemy. The enemy wanted to destroy him. And that's what Jesus wanted to reveal. That's why he let it uh, roll out the way that it did. He wanted to show the enemy's evil intent. And he wanted to show his power not only to set this man free, but to restore him completely. You know what? Both those things point to Jesus, don't they? To his power, to his divine power. When the people came and they saw this man who had tormented their community for a long time. I mean, yeah, having a, a naked demon possessed guy in your community does not help with tourism. Yeah, that, that's, it's not good for business. It, it's, it's awkward for everyone, right? Could you imagine that, that, that this guy was probably greatly feared, snapping chains, breaking free, even when he was under guard. But then they see him clothed and in his right mind and sitting at Jesus' feet, and they know that this man has met a power that is greater. The evil of this man was more than, more than the man could handle, more than the community could handle. But the power of Jesus was more than that evil could handle. And so these people, there was some discernment there. They understood that really we don't need to worry about the formerly demon-possessed man because there was a power bigger than him. What we really need to worry about is that bigger power. And they looked at Jesus and thought, man, get out of here. Because you are too powerful for us to feel safe. You know, if you're not going to submit to Jesus, he is not safe to be around. That, that, that's just true. Because he is king of kings and lord of lords. He is God almighty. And he is the ultimate judge of all of mankind. And if you are not going to submit to him, he is not safe to be around. And I think they got that. And so they asked Jesus, go away. We don't want you here anymore. Verse 36, the eyewitnesses reported how the demon-possessed man had been delivered, and all the people of the garrison region asked him, that is Jesus, to leave them because they were gripped by great fear. So getting into the boat, he returned. 
It's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Really, all three of these incredible miracles that we're going to see over the weeks, they're all there to point us to who Jesus is, that Jesus is the one we need to turn to. It's not, it's not about the storm. It's, it's not even about the, uh, the man being freed from the spirits. It, it isn't this thing of, hey, every, every storm you get into, man, you just ask Jesus. He'll just say the word and calm it. I don't know about you, Jesus does not calm all my storms, okay? There are a lot of times I call something a storm, and he does not bother to calm it, you know? His, sometimes he'll call me instead. It isn't about the storm, but it's about who he is. It's about communicating to us that he is the one that we have to turn to. He is the one that we need to look to. So Jesus leaves. And his newest disciple begs to go with him. Look at verse 38. The man from whom the demons departed begged him earnestly to be with him. But he sent him away and said, go back to your home. Tell all that God has done for you. And off he went, proclaiming throughout the town how much Jesus had done for him. Isn't that weird again? What a, a strange account this is. Jesus says yes to the demons who want to go into the piggies, okay? Jesus says yes to the crowd who wants him to leave. But the new believer who's asking for the best thing he could ask for to be with Jesus, to him, Jesus says no. Wow. This is such a, it, it is such a, a strange thing. You look at this and think, but why? Why? Why do you respond like this, Jesus? Why can't this guy go with you? Well, Think about this. The demons, they were useless. The unbelievers, they weren't willing to be used. But this new believer, this new believer, he had a purpose. He had the indwelling. He had God with him. Here is this man that Jesus sends as his ambassador. And and who gives him a purpose to go and, and to share what Jesus has done for him, that he has set him free, and to go into this community and, and to be an ambassador for Christ. It's kind of like us. I, I don't think in my lifetime I have heard more of us more often saying things like, today be a good day. Come soon, Lord Jesus. I'm ready for the rapture. Man, we are ready to get out, huh? I mean, if you had to pack a suitcase for the rapture, we'd all be carrying little suitcases with us. It's like, ready, I'm ready. Let's get out of here. This place is getting bad. <laughs> and yet here we are. And I don't know when he will come for us, but until he does, instead of packing our bags, we need to go and to tell everyone who will listen what it is that he has done for us and be his ambassadors in this place because he's the one they need to turn to. He is the only one that can rescue him. them. You look at the news and everything that's going on and I don't care what the news story is. The answer is Jesus. What they need is Jesus. It's the only thing that can save us, and it's the only thing that can save this world. Let's be his ambassadors. Let's point this world to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the opportunity to, to be together and to have you speak to us. And Lord, I pray that you would take the things that we have looked at this morning. And Lord, that you would apply them to our hearts and to our lives. God, I pray that um, as we come out from this time, that we would know that we have heard from you. That you have taught us. And, and Lord, even more than that, that you have assigned a task to us. I pray that we would see more clearly what our job is of pointing to the Savior. God, that we would occupy until you come. 
that we would be all here and completely focused on representing you while we are. Keep our eyes on you, Lord. Pray it all in Jesus' name.